Okay, welcome back from lunch. I hope it was nice and everyone um, had a good time. So now we will talk next about microservices integration and the challenges that are connected to it. We will not only speak about microservices, but I will touch all different kinds of other topics like cloud, for example, um, and also communication between different um, services. So um, yeah, it's gonna be a relatively more slides than before in, in for example, Niall's presentation, um, but we're also gonna have some live coding afterwards. So for this, I just wanted to ask and ask you how many of you actually code or are developers? Like, okay, that's pretty many, so like 90%. That's good news um, so because I'm gonna show you some code. I hope I won't bore the other people like the rest of the 10% maybe. Um, but yeah, there are gonna be also many theoretical and practical um, examples without coding. So first, um, who am I? My name is Felix, as you have heard already. I'm technical consultant with Camunda, which means I basically um, meet prospects or um, existing customers for doing training, proof of concepts. Um, so basically I visit different customers regularly and also speak at events like this one here, for example. So let's get um, straight into the topic because we have only like 30 minutes for uh, for this session. Um, I really like this slide here. Um, why why would I show you now this ocean? Um, when we're talking about microservices, one key challenge that we have is the communication between different systems. All these different microservices that you build, um, they still have to communicate in the end because they are building this overall application. Um, and you can have maybe five microservices in your organization, but it could be that you also have like a few hundred if you're a big organization like Netflix, for example, who really um, have many of them, as um, Jacob mentioned already earlier. And now you can imagine that one of these microservices could be the small house here, which tries to communicate um, to another service that could be this one here. And um, once we open the door from our house, we basically have this rough ocean here, and the rough ocean is the network, the network between these different services. We don't know what's gonna happen when we try to request um, data or when we maybe um, communicate with the other system. All different things could go wrong, and this is basically what we want to talk about here. We want to talk about three different challenges that we um, see when we are implementing microservices and when we are using them in, in production systems as well. Um, and we're gonna go through them um, step by step. So let's start um, first with communication is complex. So let's imagine you build um, these nice little small microservices um, with everything um, that belongs to it, maybe it's your own data storage, um, and you, they have full responsibility about what they're doing internally. But then um, it could be, for example, that you're running your application and at some point one of your services crashes for some reason, we don't know, goes down, it can't reach it anymore. Um, and what we see then in reality at some companies face um, is the issue that this failure will happen um, and you have to accept it, you have to be aware and you have to be ready for this. Because um, if you are not, um, then this could happen. So we maybe request this one service and this, uh, this broken service um, keeps basically not responding. Um, we have problems with that. And it could be that because of that, all other services go down as well because um, they try to communicate with each other. The timeouts pile up um, on top of each other. And at some point, the whole system is not um, responding anymore to the end user because the end user doesn't expect it. That when he tries to load a web page, for example, he expects that it will um, reply or give it a response at some point. So it's very important that you keep um, failure that happens in one microservice um, really local to this one service and that you don't um, yeah, basically let other services be affected by this error that you have in one. So what I will like to talk about is like, give you a more practical example of this. Um, how many of you have ever used a plane? Uh, just a wake up um, test after lunch. So basically everyone. Um, okay, so why is this important? Um, when you're trying to fly, you usually have to do something that is quite annoying, you have to check in for your flight. Um, this is something that you have to do on a website, maybe also with your mobile app um, nowadays. So you're, imagine you're trying to get your, your boarding pass and you go to this website and then suddenly um, an error pops up. This is now in German, German screenshot could be also in English. It just says, um, hey, we can't um, get your boarding card, um, we can't send it to you. Okay. 
Um, so let's look at what really happened there in reality. So we are this user here, we're using the web user interface and we are trying to check into our flight and most probably we have some underlying services there as well. So if it's built in a microservices way, could be for example look like this, we have a barcode generation and we also have some output management. And now what we assume in our case is now that one of these services failed. So here with this barcode generator um, can't generate our barcode, that's why we can't receive our boarding pass for our flight. So this is a problem. The good thing what they implemented there on this website is they made it possible that only because of this barcode generation it's broken, not the whole web UI is broken. So I still can use this web UI, but I have this problem that is locally here. And one um, thing that you can use to do that is something that we call a circuit breaker pattern. This is nothing that we, in we invented at Kamuna. It's something that is relatively common to use for such problems. Which means um, in case an error occurs, um, we basically switch the circuit breaker and then we don't try to communicate to one of our services anymore. And we will do that as until um, our service is back up and is running. So the circuit breaker is most probably in our scenario is here. So right from our check-in service, um, we switch it there and nothing happens anymore. So this is a good thing because otherwise it might look like this. What, this is what United Airlines is doing. If you can't check in anymore, you just get an internal server error and the whole web UI is broken. Um, this is not really nice. So it's important for us that um, we fail fast. We directly give the user the response. But at the same time, we believe that um, for many scenarios, this is not enough. So why is this not enough? You have to imagine now we have this error here in our barcode generation. And the problem with this is that um, the error that occurred in our IP system is now back at the end user. So the end user has to do something with it. He has to take care of it himself. So what he has to do in the end is he has to retry and try again and again to get his bo boarding pass. He tries to go back to the website after 10 minutes, tries to check in again. Um, he does it a few times and then at some point he just says, ah, oh, screw this, I will go to the check-in desk. This is probably not what the airline um, wants because they have maybe only one person sitting there for 300 people um, to check in. So um, yeah, now the end user has a problem. Um, some um, websites do it in a nice way. Um, some other airlines, like this one here, EasyJet for example, um, again, we couldn't check in. Um, this is really a real life uh, screenshot. We didn't make this up. Um, they actually tell you what you should do in such scenarios. So they say, okay, the check-in didn't work. Please try again in five minutes. We have a problem with our system. Please don't call us because we don't have enough support to handle all these requests. Um, this is our problem now or your problem as the end user. And this is not really nice. Um, what we suggest to do instead is maybe Okay, we have a, having some technical difficulties. Uh, difficulties. We can't present your boarding pass now. Um, we know this. We are taking care of that. But don't worry. We will take care of these errors for you. And you, as a user, you don't have to do anything. We know already that um, you requested this boarding pass. So um, let's look at this. How this could happen? Instead of having this error here, we want to have the retry. Um, basically in our check-in service. The check-in service should have some kind of functionality in order to retry this manually. So that we um, keep this failure that happened local in this area. And um, when we are talking about um, keeping the failure local in an IT system, it's most often related to something that we call state because we have to remember as an IT system that something happened and someone <coughs> tried to uh, request a boarding pass. And in order to do that, there are different ways of doing that. So we could, for example, persist this in like an entity class that we write on our own. Um, we have all different kinds of state classes that we handle um, on our own as a developer. Um, what the typical concern is of that, and this is also what we have seen in reality, unfortunately, very often um, as, as consultants, um, is that it's a lot of work um, it's a lot of complexity behind that. So it takes a very long time to implement something like this, even though you don't expect it to be the case at the very beginning. Um, because at some point you realize you need all different kinds of functionality, like for example, scheduling, versioning, um, and this just piles up the features that the business side requests from you, um, and you have to do more and more. 
Um, so the alternative to that, and this is what we actually recommend, is to use something like a state machine or a workflow engine for exactly these cases. Um, then at the same time, when we recommend people to do that, they say instead, hey, but these systems, they are super complex and we have seen them like 10 years ago, we tried to implement a BPM solution and it didn't work for us because um, they're proprietary um, and this is not really nice for us. They're heavyweight, we have to change all our systems for that um, and it's gonna take ages and de developers don't really like such systems. So we say this doesn't have to be the case. Um, when you're using a lightweight workflow engine, um, it can really be different. So what I want to do is I want to show you a very um, quick example how you can use, um, for example, Spring Boot just to create such um, servers in a very simple way with Kamunda, obviously, that's why we are here. And we are tr trying to um, have a little bit more easy example um, at this point. We're gonna concentrate on, on payment and we are gonna try to call a credit card service that charges the credit card. So we won't focus directly now on the check-in um, but rather have a different kind of process. So this is where I will show a little bit of code. I hope it's fine. Um, just a few minutes. Let's go to Eclipse. You can also use um, IntelliJ if you prefer. I'm just used to Eclipse. Um, so um, this is a relatively simple class. This is a Spring Boot project. This, is this one here on the left hand side. And the first thing that I um, I'm doing here in, in my um, class is basically I'm creating a BPMN model now in code. <coughs> so what we have seen earlier, these BPMN diagrams, um, you can model them in the Kamuna modeler if you like, or you can also use Kawimo, this web modeler tool. Um, but you can also do that in code if you prefer. Because some developers say, hey, we want to um, be more flexible, we don't really um, want to have that um, as a diagram, we don't want to, to use an additional tool for that. Um, so this is one alternative if you prefer. And still in the end, all this XML that we have shown, uh, seen earlier is generated automatically behind the scenes and we can still use tools like um, Optimize, for example. Um, so we are basically just creating a start event for our flow, it's a model that we create. Then we have um, a very simple service task. The service task is basically an automated step in our process where something is executed. In this case, it's um, a service that we are calling. So we're calling here um, basically a Spring Bean. It's a, a Stripe adapter. That's our charge credit card service that we are using. Um, we are doing this in an asynchronous way. We also say um, to Kamunda, hey, in case of an error, please retry. So this is basically where we define um, in which way do we want to retry in case of error? So we say, please retry three times um, every minute. That's what this means. Um, and if it fails, then you can create an incident and we will handle that manually afterwards in Kamunda. Um, but don't give it back to the end user, but instead <coughs> we'll keep that local in Kamunda. Then our process is, um, at the end of the process, we deploy the whole thing um, to, to the Kamunda engine. This is one way to do it. There are many, many other ways to do that. So this is how our um, class can look like, or could look like, how we call now this external system. It's a very simple um, Java delegate class. I'm sorry that I put now everything just in one file. It's probably not how you should do that. Um, but at the same time, I think it's very easy for, for demo purposes. So um, we basically create a request. Um, at the same time, we are still using inside a circuit breaker pattern. So we are using here um, Netflix Hystrix. Um, this is quite nice, I recommend it. If you don't know, maybe look into that. Um, in the end, we are doing a normal um, post request using Spring. Um, and then where, how do we actually get our request? We have implemented here um, an endpoint, a uh, API um, payment. This is version three now at the moment. And when someone calls this, so when someone requests a payment, um, we are calling this charge credit card method. And what we are doing here is we are starting now one instance of this process model that we have created with um, different kind of data. So at the moment it's just the amount, you could also pass in other data to this instance. Okay, so now let's quickly look how this um, gonna look like. I have here a small postman that is used to do requests. So if I maybe, Request now this three times. Let's see. I can go to Kamuna Cockpit. I already have it open here. 
Um, we're going to see more of this in, in detail um, later. So let's do it this way. And what we can see now is um, that we have basically the Kamuna cockpit. This is our process. It's not very huge, but still it's a process um, that calls this char charge credit card service. And we can inspect all the different instances um, that we basically just requested <coughs> using this REST endpoint. And it, in case of error that we would have here, all of this could be handled here. And I will show you later um, what you can do in case of errors, how incidents are handled, and so on. So we don't want to focus too much on this now. This was just to show you how easy it is to just use a few lines of code to create a process model. So this is nice. Now we have a state machine. Um, we have this service here um, inside of our payment. So this is um, a state machine basically inside of one microservice. It's not that we have one huge um, orchestration engine um, around there. So it also handles state, it also handles retry. This is now a different example how it could look like. And this is nice, but it could at the same time still happen that our payment fails for some reason. So this charge credit card service that I called via the REST service using Spring, it could fail. Um, and the nice thing is in BPMN, we could also model that. So we could say, okay, here's an BPMN, um, in, in BPMN, we model a boundary error event and say, okay, in case an error happened and we don't have any retries anymore left here in our Kamuna engine, we say, hey, the payment failed. And now the problem is we don't really know why the payment failed because, as I mentioned earlier, we are on this rough ocean and we don't know um, for which reason we basically couldn't get a response anymore or why it failed. So if you're a client, um, you basically have to be ready for different failure scenarios that could happen. Could be that our request doesn't reach the service provider because there's maybe a problem with the network. Could be, but also that we do this request but we don't get a response for some reason. Um, so there are all different kinds of things. Um, the response is lost maybe. Um, we don't really know. So this is something that we can then again um, handle here in our workflow engine we can basically say, okay, in some cases, if we maybe charged already the credit card and afterwards something happened, um, here, this one here, we could then refund um, the thing on the credit card afterwards if an error occurred in some underlying system maybe. So there are many different ways of handling um, errors here. <coughs> and again, this state um, is very important you have to do it reliably because you don't want um, that the customer um, maybe is charged multiple times um, and that he never gets his refund. You're gonna, they're going to be very annoyed, the end users. So it's key to understand that workflows can live in service boundaries. We see that relatively often, that we have one microservice where we put a state machine in and then we have another microservice where there's maybe no state machine inside. So this is um, the key, again, also in our check-in Coming back to this example, it could be that in our check-in we have generate 3D barcode and then we have a sent boarding, uh, boarding pass service task. That's basically our process here, whereas the barcode generator probably has other different tasks that are being implemented. And the nice thing about it is with um, a workflow engine like Kamunda, you can implement this in many different ways. So one way um, is the one I've just shown you in code. You could use Spring Boot. You have Kamunda. You also have the cockpit. You have this relational database. So you have your infrastructure basically relatively easy set up. Um, you know how easy it is to use Spring Boot. Um, and then you have your process model separately. The domain um, is really separated if you want. I've just shown you this is just in code, but you can decide how you want to have it. If you rather prefer to do it in a different way, so um, you can also use Kamunda really here on the infrastructure, the whole Wildfly application server, monolithic application server maybe, um, and then just deploy your different services on it. It really depends on what you need and how you want to shape your architecture. So this is what um, is very important for me, that um, Kamunda doesn't tell you how to do it, but we just rather give you all different kinds of options. We can recommend you different ways, but it's up to you in the end um, how you do it. So if you prefer, for example, Node.js or C Sharp, um, happy to do that this way. So it's not a problem um, for, for Kamuna to work with other programming languages. Okay. Um, another thing that we should remember is um, when we are requesting this boarding pass, um, <coughs> 
it's possible to implement workflows in a way that they are synchronous, um, synchronously involved in case when everything is fine, then you directly get the response at the end user, so HTTP 200, for example, as the status code. And in cases where we know um, it might take a while because we tried once to um, generate the 3D board, um, the barcode, but it didn't work, we could then uh, give a response with the 202, which means basically we accepted the request, we will take care of it as, as our in our engine as a state machine, and we will come back to you at some point. And the front and the user interface should then react on these different um, status codes that come back from the workflow engine. So this is really nice. Um, at the same time, when we're talking about um, asynchronous requests, there come challenges with um, asynchronous communication. So um, one thing that we have to always think about when we're doing these requests in asynchronous fashion is basically that um, there are points when timeouts could occur. So one thing um, that is very important is that you think about timeouts when you implement this. <coughs> so coming back to BPMN, what is it with timeouts? Timeouts can be modeled in a very easy way. So there are boundary events um, that you can attach, for example, to receive tasks um, that wait for the barcode again here. And in case um, they don't get this response after an hour, they could maybe um, request it again from the service automatically. Or maybe if we don't get a mail confirmation that we, the mail server really sent out this email to the, um, to the customer of ours, the passenger, then we can resend the boarding pass also automatically. Or even go a step further and use more advanced constructs um, and say, hey, four hours before the flight, we still don't have this boarding pass. We need to do something, act now. Um, then a call center agent will go ahead, get a task in his task list, for example, um, and call um, the customer to apologize and tell him, hey, now you really have to go to the check-in um, desk. For some reason, um, our systems still don't work. <coughs> so this is possible with BPMN. Um, it's important when you're using microservices, um, you have to implement timeouts and retries. And um, what is also important, your service provider has to offer you item potency, which means um, you are able to roll back certain things. And you can say, hey, um, I just um, basically give you a refund if I charge the credit card now because there was an error in our system. <coughs> As I mentioned, there are different ways of implementing um, such things with Camunda not only with uh, Spring Boot and also not only with White Application Server, when we rather look now on the communication side between different um, services. Some of our customers, they go basically the classic way, like I did it now, they're using REST or SOAP, maybe still, um, and call another service. Um, some customers also go a step further, they say, okay, um, we have these two different services, and we're gonna use a message bus here in between these different services, and we just um, use basically a publish subscribe mechanism um, here. Things like, could be for example, ActiveMQ or a BitMQ implementing the MQP protocol. Um, so this is what we see relatively often also in real life. Another way um, that we also gonna look at today, right after this talk, um, in a live coding example, is basically something that we call external tasks. <coughs> so instead of directly pushing out the work from the, com from the Kamunda side, we rather have other services subscribing to our work. So this could look like this. We have this workflow engine, and yes, we have maybe a service that deploys its model and maybe also starts instances, but we also have other services that just subscribe to certain tasks in the workflow engine, and whenever we <coughs> arrive at a certain service task in our uh, in our Kamunda application in our process, then the service would react on it, um, pull this work, get the data, execute its task, and then do a complete for the specific service task. So this is really um, now a, deco a decoupled system in this way. We'll look at this um, later how to implement this in a few minutes. Okay, um, the third challenge that we've seen is um, distributed um, transactions. So one of the challenges that you have 
when you're implementing um, yeah, microservices basically in your, in your application or when you want to do that um, is that there's nothing like um, the possibility to share transactions in an easy way between the different services. Each microservice um, has most probably its own transaction manager. Um, it handles its state on its own. That's what it should do um, and shouldn't interfere directly. Um, also things like a two-phase commit that usually doesn't scale for microservices. So um, you can end up with all different kinds of problems here as well. Um, for those of you um, who worked a little bit already in this area, um, they might have heard of um, this one here, Saga pattern. Um, this is one way of achieving or handling such situations where you have different microservices and um, you basically want to handle things like compensation in a correct way. And the same thing can be also done in BPMN. So imagine the service here, um, this BPMN process, we retrieve our payment, we dis um, deduct the existing customer credit. When the payment is complete, we charge, um, uh, if it's not complete, sorry, we charge the credit card still. In case an error occurs here, we have to roll back the whole thing. So we send something that's called a compensation throw event. We say the payment failed and we restore the customer credit only in such cases. And the workflow engine help, uh, does all of that out of the box, so we don't even have to worry about that. We model it once, the business side has to help us with that, um, obviously, because the, only the business side knows which things have to be rolled back and which are fine, because we um, don't have to roll them back. <coughs> so this is something that the workflow engine can do um, for you. Okay. So you can accept um, something that is called eventual consistency. Um, and this is very nice and this is really important that you also are able to do that when you're using um, Kamuna with microservices. So you can accept um, inconsistent state for some time, but then we will roll back in certain um, error scenarios. So to summarize that we have this client here, um, it has to implement timeouts retry and compensation and at the same time, the service provider, from the business perspective, it has to offer you all these functionalities, obvious, um, of, of course, as well. So, yeah, and never forget your state. So, um, you have to be aware of this complexity. Um, when you're working in distributed systems, when you're having this microservices, it works in the end and it scales very well, it helps you a lot, um, but you should also know all the strategies so it's not just that I go and say, hey, now go ahead and implement microservices. You really have to think about um, what you should do. Um, some people say um, you should rather start with a monolithic application and then afterwards break it down into microservices if you have the chance um, because you will um, then not implement everything in a big bang fashion and you will also know how does my application have to look like in the future. So um, yeah, if you start a project from scratch and you don't have experience in microservices, of an organization, it might not be the right choice for you. So this is really um, up to you in the end. Remember about such patterns like circuit breaker, um, most people know that already, but still um, in reality, not too many people are implementing this um, as developer. Um, Hysrix is a relatively good example of doing that. Um, it's also an open source um, product. You can try it out if you want and um, use the workflow engine if possible, um, because it offers you all different kinds of functionality. Okay, so thank you for this um, microservices talk. Um, I will stay here with you straight away. Um, and we will talk next about external tasks. So, <coughs> this is a part where I will go a little bit more into live coding as well. Uh, so, w if we remember from this architecture slide that I've shown you earlier, what are really external tasks and why would, should we use them? It's just one way of implementing microservices or microservice orchestration with the help of Kamunda. We have one very nice um, functionality, as I mentioned earlier. We have this workflow engine here. We deploy our process on it, and then all different kinds of services can subscribe to the different service tasks that we have in our BPMN process. And 
You probably remember this one here. This process I uh, just shown you wasn't too long ago, um, but it was a lot of information. Um, so this was this payment process more or less. Right? And I want to do um, this together now with you, so we're going to implement this. Um, and we, what we're going to do is we're going to implement two different um, external task workers to execute basically the whole happy pass in our process and, and also in some cases maybe we throw an error so we trigger this compensation here automatically and restore the customer credit. Um, what we're also going to do is we're going to not only use um, Java because we have also already seen Java before but on top of that we're also going to use uh, Node.js or some JavaScript. Um, I hope that's not uh, too confusing. I don't know how many people are yeah. using JavaScript here. So let's do that. Um, some life hack. So first of all, we should um, have a look at the process again in the Kamuna Modeler. This is the tool, the desktop application that Jacob mentioned earlier that you can download um, just on our website. Install it, works on all operating systems. Um, under the hood, it uses bpmn.js as one of our JavaScript libraries that we offer also open source um, to display and render and be able to modify bpmn diagrams and it also automatically generates this whole XML <coughs> code automatically for you. So you don't have to care about that or don't worry about that actually. Care maybe you should. Um, so how do we implement this? Um, we don't really have to do anything with the start and end events. They are implemented automatically by the workflow engine. But what is interesting always is to see what do we have to do in the service tasks, in these <coughs> automated steps to make them run. And in Kamunda you have, as I mentioned, different ways of implementing that. Earlier in my example that I've shown, instead of external, we used here this delegate expression when we called the spring bean automatically. Right? This is what I did in code instead. Um, but you could also do that in the BPM in, um, in, the, in the Kamuna modeler here. So I've chosen the external task here and I also have to give it a name. So I should say, okay, this is the customer credit um, microservice now that um, executes only this specific functionality. And then we have a gateway. Gateways um, you can implement in this way that the following sequence paths you define what kind of expression we have. So here we are checking the remaining amount of our payment, do we still have to um, charge the customer something on his credit card, yes or no, so a bit larger than zero, we probably should go this way, and in all other cases, we take the other sequence flow. And um, then the next step, again service task, this time again external, and here we have um, charge uh, card at this point, that's how I chose the name. And we also have to implement the errors. <coughs> This looks like this, so we basically define what is the name of the error because you could define different types of business related errors um, on a single service task or also on a larger scale at, uh, or larger scope on the um, process model. And then the compensation um, is relatively easy, so you don't really have to define anything here um, because the process engine knows automatically because this compensating boundary event is attached to the service task, it will automatically uh, call this if we went this way um, in our process instance. Okay. Happy to answer questions also uh, afterwards, so don't, don't worry um, if you miss something right now. Um, what I did now, there are different ways to deploy this process model. You could use the modeler straight away and deploy it here. I, I already have it deployed because it was part of my um, Spring Boot project. So if I go to my cockpit again, you will see exactly this process model. This is um, version 6 of this payment process. Okay, so what we can do now is we should maybe start a few instances. And this time, this is version 6 again with no payload. Um, it's just an example. So let's send a few requests. Maybe first... Uh, five or so, okay. And if we refresh here our page, we should see that um, they are basically waiting here. So we have five instances now waiting 
at the existing, uh, deduct existing customer credit. Why is that? We don't have any service running at the moment. We haven't implemented anything. Um, so I still have some work to do to enable to, to make this work. And as I mentioned, we have on the one hand side, we have the Java worker, and on the other side, we're gonna have the JavaScript worker. <coughs> and the first service task that I have to implement is basically the JavaScript worker because it's the first service for um, deducting the customer credit. <coughs> what do you need here? It's a relatively easy setup, so you need one dependency. For those of you who know JavaScript, it's probably nothing new. You just define the dependency to this um, NPM package that Kamuna provides, Kamuna External Task Client JS. Um, and then we basically reuse that here in our, uh, in our code. We create a client with a specific config. So we tell uh, this Node.js application, hey, please use the base URL from Kamuna, use my local machine, use the REST endpoint, um, and we also have some logger where you can log out some stuff. And now I created this client, but I still have to tell him what should he do. So we can do something like this. We subscribe to a specific topic, and this topic you will find here. So this is the topic name, customer credit. And then we can implement a function um, and we say, okay, we will retrieve, get back whenever um, it, the task is ready for us, we will get back this external task and we will also back an external task service. Um, yep. And then, yeah, to do the brackets. Always hard to see the brackets in JavaScript for me. Um, and then what we can do is, we could retrieve now all different kinds um, of variables from this service. Um, in our case, I will just make my life very easy. So I create um, variables, so this is like this, new variables, and I will say, okay, we need one, one variable at least in our process to make this work because we want to have this remaining amount and this is not generated any, anywhere at the moment. So we probably should have some business logic here in this case where, which calculates if there's any remaining amount or not. I'm not gonna do this for now, I'm just gonna hard code that um, just because we have only a few minutes left. Um, and then what I will do is I will say, hey, external task service, please um, complete this one now. and um, we pass in the variables that we have used before. Okay, so let's try if I did anything wrong. Okay. Okay, I did something wrong of course. Okay, complete is not called complete, but complete task, I think. Let's see, documentation always knows the most. Not task service, dot complete, await. Let's see, let's do this this way. Okay, so we have to subscribe <coughs> here, this is what we did, right? Client.subscribe. Um, we subscribe to the customer credit, we have our async function here, this is exactly what we did, so we have the external task, external task service, um, we open this one, and then this. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So this should, should be right. I always have a fallback uh, solution for that. So let's see task. Probably have some bracket wrong or something like this. So let's do it this way. Okay. So this works now. Um, it's subscribed to the customer credit task. This is um, relatively nice. 
Okay, so this um, is now here, customer credit, this is working. And now we should implement our charge card worker as well. So this we're going to do now using um, Java instead. And what we're going to do is we're going to subscribe to the different tasks. So let's go here, um, charge card. And what we have to do here, it's called, um, we have to implement a handler. And um, this handler takes again now this external task and the external task service. And what we also, what is very important here in this case is that we have to open a subscription, return may, let's please get that. Um, again, here we can get um, now the variables if we want. So we could, for example, get this remaining amount if we wanted. So it's relatively easy to do that. Um, or also the original amount of this um, specific credit card payment that we had here in this case. But we can also say, okay, Let's do it this way. In some cases, um, we want to fail the specific task. So we are using this external task service and say not complete, but in some cases, we are throwing a BPMN error. This is what we have to do. So we say, okay, for our external task, we provide this error and the error code is something that we do have here in our credit card service. And in other cases, we maybe just complete this specific task. Okay. And then what we can do is we can um, run this as well. Okay, so this is now running all the time. Um, let me just check again if the um, this one here is subscribing to customer credit customer credit, this is correct. Let me also deploy the latest version. Okay. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna start a few more instances. And then here we see now some tasks are being completed. So you will see that in the log as well. Um, we completed the task. Our um, Java service at the moment doesn't talk too much, but if we go here back again, payment six, we go now to the latest version because I updated the model a little bit. Um, we see now here that we have one instance where basically we went um, through that. So I think we should do create a few more. I have here a small um, runner. So we maybe create like 20 of them or so. That's number six. Let's create like 50, one millisecond delay maybe. And now it goes ahead and just runs request um, in our worker. We should see now there are many um, tasks coming, of course. It's pulling all the time, it's getting all the tasks. Um, and we should also see that in our um, cockpit now. So if we refresh here again, we see now many instances going through the diagram. And in some scenarios, we actually call now, this should be about, the, of about half of them because we have this mass random inside there. So sometimes we fail the payment and we restore the customer credit automatically. What you can also do is now you can click on this payment failed um, and then we go inside there and um, you can see the single instance called this one. What we didn't implement yet, um, or haven't implemented, is the restoring of the customer credit. So this could be another service, or it could be actually part of our JavaScript client. But because um, I already took some time to get this JavaScript working, even though I'm better at JavaScript than um, Java, that's very funny, um, I'm not gonna implement this one now, but you can imagine um, this is what you could implement now as well. And you can also um, directly see all the history of that. So you can see, okay, we have these different external task um, instances that were created and who completed them. You can give the different microservices names as well. Um, and then you can go ahead and even <coughs> scale them. So coming back 
um, to this to the slides just for a minute. If we don't have much time. From our perspective, these external tasks are the perfect um, answer for um, a decoupled microservices architecture from Komuna perspective. Um, it helps you to solve many pr programming problems um, on the way. Um, and we can solve things like polyglot programming, um, scaling and clustering, and so on and so on. So um, if you have questions, please feel free to um, ask me later on. I think we are already over time, so thank you all. Thanks.